your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of John. We're picking up in chapter 18. So we're in John's Gospel 18. Um, And normally I don't do this, but if anyone wants paper Bible and they didn't bring one, you can raise your hand. Somebody will bring you a Bible so you can follow along. We got a few people uh, just so we can follow along. Or however, if you booted up your Bible, you immediately have been judged. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) It's all good. I I booted my Bible up, so we're good. But John chapter 18, we're picking up... um, Last week, Ricardo finished chapter 17. Chapter 17 was the prayer of Jesus and really encapsulated a whole section. So this morning, we're going to start in a, in a kind of a fresh, different section. But the section we looked at, or we wrapped up last week, was an absolutely amazing section of text where Jesus, knowing that he is heading to death and the cross... He pulls his inner group of guys, the the gang, if you will, the guys, he pulls them together, and he really relays some information that's important and specific to them, but also for us. And the, the, the specifics that he gives to them are, look, I'm leaving, they didn't want to hear that, but in my absence, I'm going to give you information as to how you continue your relationship with me. And in our human understanding, we go, wait a minute, if you're gone, we can't continue the relationship. But in this, he gives us this amazing way to be connected to him through the giving of the helper, the Holy Spirit. And what we have is just an absolutely amazing uh, section of scripture that's not found in any other gospel where Jesus tells us specifically what the Holy Spirit's going to do in our lives. And it's a great instructional section of, of scripture. If you missed it, go back and get the tapes. I'm just kidding. There's no tapes, but you can go online and find that stuff. But it was really, really good. Um, and so I'm just going to really quickly give us a little bit of a summation. The first thing Jesus did in that section of scripture was to give us the new commandment. And the new commandment that he gave us was to love one another as I have loved you. That was the commandment. I mean, I think of the other gospels when uh, the, the man asked Jesus, well, what is the greatest commandment? He said, to love the Lord your God. And also the other one is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And here it's a little bit different because he's speaking to the disciples, telling sort of the church, but the disciples, you love one another. And when you love one another and the world sees this love, they're going to want it. They're going to look at it and say, something's different. These people care about each other and they're doing things for one another. And there's a a genuine love. It's going to be a potent evangelism tool. And so Jesus gives us that commandment, and, and throughout the section, he told that, us that commandment twice in the section, uh, but throughout the whole section, he told us like four times, he gave us the layout of how to pray, that we are to pray to the Father, that we are to make request, and that, and that we're to pray in the name of Jesus. He gives us this over and over and over. I think it's because we need to hear it over and over and over so that we can do the right thing in our times of prayer. We're supposed to pray trusting God fully, trusting his love for us. And then again, this is that only section where Jesus gives us specific Holy Spirit instruction. So important. So now we're moving on to the first, it's really actually not the first domino in the effects, it's the second domino in the events that lead him to the cross and to the burial and to the resurrection. The first, if you remember, already happened earlier in that evening at the the supper, and it was Judas leaving to go betray him. That's really the first domino of the the events that have been set in motion. Um, But we're going to pick up with the second one here, and that is uh, Jesus being betrayed in the garden. So we're beginning with a a, a descent, a, a difficult thing, Jesus heading to the cross, But in and through it, we still see his love and his glory through even heading to the hardest day of his life. So before we dive into verse 1 of chapter 18, let's pray. Lord, Father, we come before you, and we ask that you meet us here in your word. And Father, we ask that you would send your helper to make your word come alive to our hearts, that we would be changed, or that we would live different, that we would look different. 
God, that we would be the hands and feet, that we would be Christ to someone who doesn't know love. Lord, help us to get outside of ourselves. but Lord, help us as we take a bite from your living word this morning. Lord, bless it to us. Lord, amplify it and just let it do that which it is intended to do in our hearts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So chapter 18, verse 1. It says, when Jesus had spoken these words, when he'd finished his prayer in that five-chapter section of Scripture, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples had entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met with his disciples there. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. So we have, again, this change of scene. Jesus is left from where he's been for the last, well, we, we would think uh, at least three of the chapters. I think it's at the end of verse or chapter 15 that it says that, that then they rose from that place to go out. But knowing guys and what they were talking about, they probably just stood around and kept talking, and then one of them sat down, and then they all sat back down. I mean, this kind of fellowship that's going on here. Or they could have been making their way through Jerusalem over to the, this Garden of Gethsemane. E either way, this is where Jesus finally arrives at the garden. They cross the book Kidron. They go up into what is known as the Mount of Olives, into a garden. So it's going to be... Uh, basically an, an olive tree grove, if you will. And so it's not a garden like maybe you would think, like with rose and carrots and radish or whatever. This is a, a different type of garden, a beautiful place with these olive trees, with uh, just sort of, I, I pictured on a sunny day, birds and amazing, gorgeous, beautiful place that they visited often. And I'm getting way ahead of myself. So let me back up here just a second. Before they get there, they cross this book, Kidron, and I just want to take a moment to sort of uh, explain a little bit about the brook Kidron. The scene that they're in, the supper that they just had, the table that they just left, was the Passover supper. And at Passover in Israel, there would have been such, I shouldn't say Israel, in Jerusalem, there would have been such an influx of people from all over Israel, even from outside of Israel, who were Jewish, coming to celebrate the Passover it would have been just jam-packed full of people. In fact, Josephus, the Jewish uh, historian, said that at, at any given Passover, there could be upwards of 200,000 sheep sacrificed. And it took more than one day. It was a multiple-day event of these, offering, of these offerings. And so the Brook Kidron was down in a valley off of the Temple Mount, and so the blood of the lambs would flow down this hill and hit the brook Kidron and would flow down to where Jesus was crossing. And the name Kidron actually means shady or dark. It could have been shady or dark because of the blood that would have entered. But it just sort of makes me stop and think about what it would have meant to Jesus, who is the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world, to cross through this brook where the blood of the lambs was running, and to think, I am the fulfillment of that. That was a picture pointing to Jesus, the one who would come. And you think of the Passover, what the Passover was, the first Passover, all the way back in Egypt, when God delivered the children of Israel. And they were to take that lamb, and they were to sacrifice the lamb, and take the blood, and put the blood on the doorposts of the house so that the judgment would pass over their house. This is what Jesus came to do, to save us from our sin, to save us from ourself. Uh, so often I say, and, and it's just sort of my favorite little phrase, that he came to save me from myself. And the sin that would separate me from him and here as he's crossing over, I just it, there's sort of an irony as he crosses the book Kidron and heads up into the garden. But he went into the garden. Now John doesn't tell us in the text which garden it is. The title of my little passage here says the Garden of Gethsemane. But Matthew and Mark both tell us it's the Garden of Gethsemane. John does tell us, though, in verse 2 that it was a place that they visited often. 
this was sort of a normal, familiar place that Jesus would take his disciples. Now, there's kind of some different thoughts. There's a couple of commentaries I went through that said that some of these gardens on this hill were privately owned gardens. And so someone who had maybe encountered Jesus, maybe given their life to Jesus, we're not sure, but someone gave permission for them to go into this garden and it to be sort of a sanctuary to hang out. So again, I go back to the beauty of this place and a place that they went to often, probably almost every time they ended up in Jerusalem. Remember, most of Jesus' ministry was in the area of Galilee up north around the Sea of Galilee. But whenever he would make his way to Jerusalem, this was a place that he often would visit with his disciples to hang out. It was a special place to all of them. But I would say more so specifically to Jesus, a place where they could pull alone, pull away from all the crowds that were pressing in. And I'm sure their time that was spent there was sweet, as I'm sure Jesus would teach them and hang out with them. I mean, I mean, picture this, hanging out with God in a garden. Doesn't that sound great? And you know what it harkens back to is what it was in the beginning. When, when God walked in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve. And here we have Jesus, God, hanging out with his disciples in the garden. I just, I want to go. I want to hang with Jesus in the garden. What a special thing this would have been, just enjoying Jesus, probably watching him pray, hearing his prayers, hanging out with God in his creation. So a couple of things about this garden. Number one is it was a place that Jesus went that, that Judas thought he probably would go to. But it was a place that Jesus went to when he was facing the most difficult thing he would ever face in his life. So that thought in itself brings a question to mind. If you were facing the most difficult thing in your life, where would you go? What would you turn to? Hopefully your answer isn't the pub or, in my case, I think sometimes too often, the refrigerator. But, but those things in our lives, they're, they're things that we turn to in hardship and difficulty for comfort, for reprieve, something to turn to. But here we see Jesus, he goes to a familiar place. Now, sometimes you might go to a place that's familiar, or you might go to a place you've never been before. This is something kind of common. But I think the bigger question is, would you let that difficult situation drive you to something, or would you go where he has already led you before? Just something to think about. And hopefully your answer isn't the refrigerator or Dairy Queen or the bar. But maybe you would end up somewhere you've never been. Maybe you would end up at a place like a Sunday night prayer meeting, earnestly seeking God. That'd be a good place to go. Or maybe you'd end up in the Word in just a different, real, powerful, alive way, a little more than usual. And those aren't bad things, but hopefully... It is a place where you have often been to with Jesus in the very presence of God. And here's what we see, the example from him. He goes to this familiar place, this place where they've hung out in nature, in his beauty, the presence of God, in his friends, his disciples. Now, let me just say something else as we're thinking about this, something that I believe is sort of obvious But Jesus never traded a place like that for church. This is not what Jesus did. And the the thought that I'm kind of trying to answer in my mind is some people, you might hear him say this, well, I worship God out on the trail on the mountain. And I think you could definitely worship God on the trail on the mountain. When you get out like Jesus here in a beautiful place that God's created, you praise him. And one of the last times I went walking with a couple of buddies of mine, I just would not shut up about how beautiful it was. I'm like, this is so awesome. I'm here with you guys. And they're all believers. And this is, it's gorgeous. And I think after a while, they were like, dude, just, it's okay. We know we've been here before. Just stop. But it's an awesome thing. Or you hear people say, well, I worship God out on the lake. And you can definitely worship God on the lake. Or you could say, I worship God out on the golf course. Or you fill in the blank. 
But, but the point that I'm getting to is Jesus never traded those things in. He did both of them. It was his custom. From the Gospel of Mark, we see it was his custom, his tradition to go to synagogue. And synagogue was just the equivalent uh, pre-church of the people of God gathering together weekly, every Saturday. Jesus did not forsake meeting together with God's people to worship. It was what he did. It was who he was. And he'd get out in creation and go, this is the Lord's, and it's beautiful. And so because of the familiarity in this place, and it was so common, Judas knew that they would probably be there. And I, and I think it was probably by intention. I mean, Jesus wasn't trying not to get caught, and we'll see that here in a moment. But this brings up another observation as we think about Judas and the way that he betrayed Jesus. I mean, and it's hard enough to have someone close of the inner circle or your closest friends betray you. But also, he had some insider information that he betrayed Jesus with. And that was his favorite place to hang out. I know where he'll be. A bit of personal information. And you know, when I think about this, I think, man, God, it's crazy that in your sovereignty, you allowed Jesus to be betrayed by a close friend like this, because he didn't have to. He could have went to the cross another way, but you chose that it would be this way. And personally, I think it's because Jesus, as our great high priest, has been through the things that humans go through. And this morning, you, you might be sitting here and have been betrayed or hurt badly by a very close friend, and hopefully their face is not flashing in your mind right now. If it is, that's okay. We'll forgive you later. Just kidding. It's just a human thing. And so Jesus, let me just tell you, if you've been through or going through that, Jesus can relate to your deep hurt. He can relate to that betrayal. Another note here, how did Jesus respond to this betrayal? Well, let me just say one thing. He didn't just write everybody off. And sometimes that happens with people. And let me just say specifically, sometimes that happens in the church. Someone gets hurt by somebody in the church in leadership or in ministry, and they end up writing off the church. They're like, you know what? I'm just, I'm out. I'm done. I'm done with church. I'm done with all of this stuff. Jesus never did that. He's our example. He didn't write off the believers. He didn't say, that's it. I'm not going to the cross. He didn't write off Christians as a whole. No. As we're going to see here in a moment, he continued on in his faithful love to those who would betray and hurt him. But I believe that this does happen within the church a lot. You know, as I was saying that first service, I thought to myself, you know, it's in the church, but it's because there's people in the church. You can go anywhere where there's people and get hurt. That's just kind of part of life. But it does happen in the church. And, and let me just say this morning, I don't mean to excuse the wrongdoings of church leadership or pastors. That's not my goal this morning. But so many times people leave a church and they write off the whole group because of a wrong done to them. I want to just share with you this morning that from my perspective and my point of view, I understand personally what it's like to be hurt by someone in the church and to go through difficulty by someone in the church. And it hurts and it's not right. But I can also stand here this morning and say, that the love of Jesus to me personally at the cross has healed and is continually still healing the hurts that have been caused in my life. And I hope that's your testimony. I hope the love of Jesus is continuing to heal the hurts that people, whether intentionally or unintentionally, have made in your life. He's the answer. His love is the healing power. His blood is the healing power to heal the hurts that are caused in this life. But you know what? Let me, let me step back and say one more thing. I also want to relate to you that I have received healing love to those same places in my life through people in the church. Amen. That God still uses flawed people to heal and minister healing to our lives. And, and I'm thankful for the church. And just like Jesus, all of the flaws and blemishes, it's okay. 
He's greater. He's bigger than all those things. What an awesome Savior we have to example what it is to continue to love in the midst of hurt, betrayal, and pain. Now, I have another note here just in relation to the garden, and that is that John leaves out that passionate prayer of Jesus. You guys remember the one where he sweat great drops of blood and said, Lord, if there's any other way but not my will, but your will be done? John left this out. Now, I'm not exactly sure why he did. The only thing that comes to mind is that John seems to be doing what John has been doing throughout this gospel, and that is being led by the Spirit of God to share significant moments in the life of Jesus that the other gospels don't have, like chapter 17. And that whole section, 13 through 17. And so I'm thankful for the gospel of John. I'm thankful for a different man's perspective. And that the Holy Spirit reminds him of these things so that we can see these different aspects of Jesus and what he does. So then John, he goes straight into these troops coming uh, to get Jesus in verse 3. And he says, it says there, Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So at this point, John describes, and it's in the words that he uses, he describes a military troop that is actually coming to grab Jesus, to take him. So it's a military group. It's like a, I don't know what you, exactly what you would call it, but it's not just what you would picture reading it, like an angry mob of people with pitchforks and torches. That's not what the scene is. It's a lot more organized than that. The word that John uses for this detachment of troops, it, it means a military cohort, the 10th part of a legion. And a legion was 6,000 men. So we're talking about probably 600 men, Roman troops, Roman soldiers, armed and coming uh, behind Judas to the garden. When I think about that, I think, man, that's a lot of troops for 12 guys, right? Judas left, there's 11 and Jesus, right? So we got 600 troops, probably. Now, there are some other commentaries that think that's too much. They say, no, I think it's probably more like 200 troops. Still, if it was 200 troops, that's 17 soldiers per individual. That's kind of overkill. If it was 600 troops, it's 50 soldiers per individual. So it's interesting. But we have listed here, we got the officers also, besides from the, the, aside from the Roman troops, we got the officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And this would have been the temple guard. So we got this crew of, we don't know how many, I'm thinking 20 to 50 temple guards coming out. And then we don't know how many Pharisees or chief priests or priests that all came out to see this. It doesn't say that they came out. It says that their guards came out. We're going to find out a little bit later that one of their servants is involved. And with the servant being involved, you would think that the master of the servant would be there with them. We're not 100% sure. I tend to think they were probably there because I know humans and they want to see. They want to What's going to happen when they go arrest Jesus, right? And they're probably in the back somewhere trying to peek. I mean, that's just my guess. Anyways, we got a huge detachment. So the question comes to mind, why so big? Why such a huge detachment of troops? And there's two thoughts behind this. The first one is from the Roman mindset. Again, going back to uh, that the, the feast of Passover was happening right now, and the, the, the amount of people in the town, it does not even compare to Memorial Day weekend in Payson, right? You guys know Memorial Day weekend in Payson. You're just like, oh, great. I'm not going to be able to go anywhere. Stock up, right? Stay home. Don't go out in the streets. There's crazy people. <clears throat> but, but here we're talking not just doubled or tripled. I mean, the amount of people that came here to, to offer those over 200,000 sheep, it was, it was packed, packed with people. And because of it also being a celebration of their new year, any time a bunch of Jews got together in occupied Roman territory, the Romans were on defense. They were on guard. They were looking for an uprising of zealot Jews to say, it's time to overthrow Rome. And so because of this thinking and because of Jesus sort of leading a little band of people 
they could have been on guard. And so bringing this big troop. And the second thought is the Jewish thought, the Jewish leaders. And the thought behind the Jewish leaders, the Romans didn't really personally know Jesus. Some of them probably did. But the Jews did. Because Jesus was making a stir in the Jewish community through his healings, through his miracles, through his calming of the waves and the wind, through raising of Lazarus from the grave, all of the things that Jesus was doing. Now, if you were going to arrest this kind of power, do you think you'd be like, maybe you should take a couple more troops? Just saying. I don't know exactly what Jesus is capable of. I know what he's capable of for the good and the possibilities are endless. But if we go to arrest him, I don't know what he's going to do. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. Bring some more troops. All right? So here's kind of the mindset. And so they're out there. They're led by Judas. Verse 4, Jesus, therefore, knowing all the things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. And then Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So a few things here as we look at this section. One of the things that strikes me right off the bat is these guys coming to find Jesus in this garden. They didn't have to even call for him or ask him as soon as they showed up. And you could just picture a flood of guys coming into this tree orchard, a flood of people coming. And as soon as they showed up, Jesus stepped out in front and said, who are you looking for? In other words, the first thing I see is Jesus protecting the people that are with him. I see him stepping out. I see him being just brazen, brave. He knew he was going to the cross. He knew this was the way, and he stepped right into it. I mean, it's that, it's, that, it's that verse that talks about his face was set like flint. He became rigid in what he was going to do, and he knew he was going to do it. Also, this time, during the Passover season, it's usually really close to a full moon. So visibility late at night, in the middle of the night like this was, it would have been pretty high. But because he was in this orchard, and there were some caves in the area. I think that's really why they brought lanterns and torches. They were thinking they were going to have to find these guys hiding. And they didn't have to. Jesus stepped out. So everyone there knows ho- who he is. And he says out to them, he, he steps out to them. I, I'm sorry, I, I, I said that wrong. Not everyone there knew who he was. But let's just look at this. He steps out. He says to them, who are you seeking? And their response isn't. You, Jesus. Meaning, I think that the guys that are asking this are probably just the Roman overseers of the troop. They don't know him personally. I guarantee you there were some people there, Judas, a few of the priests, that knew exactly which one he was and were probably standing behind the Roman troops watching this go down, right? But so they ask him who he is, and Jesus uh, or, or Jesus asks who it is they're looking for. Here they respond, Jesus of Nazareth. And what did Jesus say? He said to them, I am he, and it says there in the text, everyone after he said that, everyone there drew back and fell to the ground. So before we look at the act of them falling down itself, we have to look at what Jesus said. And in your Bible, the word he in your Bible should be in italics, which means something specific. It simply means that it was added by the translators to try to give us greater understanding as to who was speaking, that it was Jesus. And so what we see here, though, and they would do this often. Whenever you see a word that's in italics, it's to help understanding. It's done by the people that were translating, whether they were translating from uh, Greek into German or Greek into English. They would, they would put little helps in there. And this was, this was meant to be a help, but the truth is, it's not really well placed. And I'm thankful it's in italics, because in the original Greek, the thing that Jesus says is, I am. It's the same thing that he said in John chapter 8, verse 58, to the religious rulers who were questioning and claiming him. And the translators got it right there. They just left it, I am. But these guys, these religious rulers, they were questioning and claiming him to be of illegitimate birth. They were saying, we know who our father is. Who's your father? Because he was born of a virgin, right? So they're razzing him over this. 
And then they finally get to the point where they say, we know our father. Our father is Abraham. And what did Jesus say? Before Abraham was, I am. And in that phrase, we get the clear meaning of what Jesus says in, in this section of scripture, in this verse. I am. Before Abraham was, I am. Meaning this, which is really the definition of what I am is. And it's simply the one who always was and always will be. I'm the constant one. He is saying, I am God. Now, back in uh, John chapter 8, verse 58, they knew exactly what he was saying because they took up stones to kill him. They were going to throw rocks at him until he died. But here he is. He speaks this truth. Jesus' response to them, who, uh, and who are you seeking, is, I am. And, and they did. Their response to that was the only thing they could do was to fall back from the power of the name of our Savior. The only thing they could do. And, and of course, in my mind's eye, I'm kind of spoiled and tainted by modern movies and superhero movies. And I just picture this kind of like being this bassy sound and then shockwaves going out and everybody falling down. Now, it doesn't say that happened. I'm just saying, in my mind, I just think, I am, you know, and everyone's flat. Whoa! But they all fell down. And notice, they all fell down. Could you imagine 600 men falling down at the name of Jesus. Let me just remind us that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Yes. And it's sort of like the same kind of comparison. These guys didn't willingly do it, but at the name, at the power of who he is, they were caused to fall, to see this power. Which I think of the great power of it. I think, man, that is an awesome scene. Now, what what happened? Why why did this have to happen? Was it Jesus going, hey guys, watch this? I'm going to show you something cool. I am, you know. He wasn't proving how cool he was or how powerful he was to the disciples. No. Did he do it to strike fear into the hearts of the soldiers? And I would say off the hand, no. Because if, if that was what he was doing, to strike fear into their hearts, I think when they fell down would have been a great time to escape. And so he wasn't trying to escape. And so the thought is, so, so what is he doing? I, actually, I was thinking about this. I'm like, that would have been the time. If I was a disciple, I would have been, that's my cue. Foo, right? As <laughs> soon as everyone's on the ground, I'm out of here. But I believe that what he did this for was to show everyone in the scene, the enemy and the disciples alike, and us who get to look into this scripture, his power, yes, his glory, yes, but also that Jesus is the only one who is in complete control in every situation. Every situation, even in death. Jesus is going to face death. He's still in complete control and submission to the plan. And so the biggest thing that it proves to everyone in this scene is they're going to bind him. They're going to put ropes on him and ch- or chains or however they do it. But when they lead him away, the biggest testament that we get is it's not because he's bound. He has power over all of that. He's bound by love. He's bound by obedience to his father. His willingness and everyone in the garden knew it that night. And so, once they all kind of get back up from whatever that looked like, get themselves regrouped and back together, verse 7, Jesus asked them again, whom are you seeking? (laughs) Personally, I think when they answered this time, it was probably a little different tone. Um, We're looking for Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. In verse 8, and Jesus answered, I've told you that I am, therefore, if you seek me, and what does he say? Let these go their way. And then John notes in verse 9 that, he, this, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke, of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. So John just shares with us, this is the fulfillment, that he would lose none, that Jesus spoke this before, and he's fulfilling it here. But again, we see this, and, and I love this. This is one of those things that kind of for 
the, I don't know how many times I've gone through this passage of scripture, but this time the thing that sort of jumped off my pay, off the page and grabbed me by the heart was Jesus' heart of a shepherd. He's getting arrested to go to his death, and he's worried about the disciples. He says, but leave, leave them alone. And can I just remind you of something? The most important thing to Jesus is you. The most important thing to Jesus is you, his disciples, your growth, your well-being. And I don't know what you're facing in life. You might be going through something really hard. You might be going through a season of joy. I don't know. You might have grandkids. You might have loss of life. I'm not sure where you're at, but I want you to know that his best is for you. His interest is for you to grow you, to love you. Man, he's so, so good. And here he is looking out for his own. Thank you, Jesus. Now, Jesus does know that he's going to give his life for the sins of the world. But he also still has big plans for the disciples. There's going to be a lot of work that they got to do. And it's going to be a good work. So before Jesus is led away captive from the garden... He has to clean up one more mess. He's got one more miracle to do. So let's check it out. Verse 10. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. And the servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Now, I think my inflection was wrong. Personally, when, in verse 11, I think Jesus just said, Put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that my father has given me? And Peter, this is all part of the plan. Put the sword away. But I mean, still, I, I have to say here in this moment, Peter is fulfilling what he told Jesus earlier. Remember, Jesus said, you're going to all scatter. And Peter said, no, not me. These guys might. But I won't leave you. In fact, I would die for you. And so here we have this little moment where Peter, it's still one of those oy vey moments for Peter. What are you doing? But at the same time, we see his heart to fulfill what he said. Because in the face of 600 troops, Peter pulls a sword out. And did he put his life in danger? 100%. Absolutely. But then at the same time, I'm still, I'm still looking at what Peter did and wondering, wait a second. It's not quite as brave as it seems because who did he attack? Did he go after the Roman troop leader? No. Did he go barreling into the, the, the soldiers? He didn't. He actually attacked a servant. And in my mind, I think, now, wait a minute. Did the servant have armor? I don't know. I would probably say no. I don't think he did. Did he have a sword? I doubt it. So why would Peter attack him? I, I personally, this is just my speculation. I think because in the heat of the moment, the adrenaline rising up, he knew he was going to attack somebody, the closest one to him. He went for it. And I, that's just my speculation. Now, I did go in and check out the word servant. And this is not like the chief priest's bodyguard, right? Because some of those guys would have that. They'd have like uh, the secret service guys around the important people. When you look at the word servant, there's no, nothing inclina no inclination that that's the case. It's just a guy helping him do his daily tasks, and so here Peter attacks the servant. I don't know if he was a scrawny little guy. In my mind, he is. I just kind of thank God that he missed what he was aiming for. Obviously, he was trying to kill him, right? He wasn't trying to harvest ears. He was trying to kill the guy. He missed, and he hit the ear. Although, I would have to say, the other gospels reveal to us that Jesus picked the ear up, dusted it off, and put it back on and healed the man. I would have to say it had been a, quite the miracle if he chopped his head off and Jesus had to pick that. <laughs> right? Rolling down the hill. Hey, stop that thing. I got to put it back on. But here he is. So there's a couple of questions. Why did he pick the servant? We don't know. How, how did he cut off his right ear? We just, and commentaries love to talk about this. Well, he was probably right-handed. So how do you cut off his right ear? He was probably walking away from Peter and Peter swung and chopped the right ear off. And that's all, I don't know. That's just people trying to figure out what happened. You know, when a sword comes out and it's life or death, things go down different than you would think. That's for sure. But it, 
as we look at this, another note here, this record, it is in all of the Gospels. Luke is the one that speaks of Jesus picking up the man's ear and, and putting it back on and healing him. But this is the only gospel that mentions who it was that chopped off Malchus's ear. John's the only one bold enough to say it was Pete, right? <laughs> I just want to let you guys know. Now there's a couple of thoughts behind as to why. And it kind of seems like John and Peter kind of razz each other a little bit. It just it does seem like that happens. We know that later on at, at the resurrection, when Peter and John run to the tomb to see it empty. John has to just throw it in there, and I beat him. I'm faster, right? I'm faster than Pete. And so it's just one of those things. But also, this gospel was written by John at the end of John's life. And John, church history says, lived to be about 90 years old, which was very, very old. I mean, the average life span at that day and age was like late 30s, early 40s. And so John is, is very old, and Peter has already been martyred at this time for his faith. And, Paul, and John includes. It's just something interesting to think about, to ponder. But another interesting note here is how John names Malchus, the servant. And I have to just stop and think. He didn't have to. He could have just said the servant of the priest or the chief priest. But he named him by name, and it, it gets me thinking, was there somebody in mind as John's writing and penning this gospel and knowing that he's sending it to the churches? Is there a church where a guy with a healed ear maybe is sitting in the pew and he's writing it thinking? And maybe John even knows him personally. I don't know. And I don't know if Malchus is saved or not. All I know is if some rabbi who was supposed to be the Messiah picked my ear up and stuck it back on my head, that would be a life-changing event. <laughs> I would have a whole lot of pondering of who this man is and what he came to do. And I'd be looking at what he said. Maybe Malchus read this scripture. I don't know. Something to think of personally between you and me. I think we're going to see Malchus in heaven. And one more thing. It's interesting but Peter here, Jesus really, I believe, saved Peter's life. Because if there was evidence, if Malchus walked into the, the court with an ear in his hand, Peter would have been in big trouble. I think he would have died. He would have lost his life for what he did. But Jesus cleans up the mess. <laughs> I'm so thankful for Jesus cleaning up our messes cleaning up my mistakes. And we see here that, that, G, that Peter does something here that really doesn't need to happen. Peter decides he's going to defend Jesus. Jesus just proved he doesn't need Peter's defense. He knocked everyone down with a word. But here we see this problem that we often run into, and we in our own strength and in our own understanding, try to defend God. Jesus doesn't need our defense. He's, he, he's got it under control on his own. And when I think of Peter whacking this guy's ear off with the sword, I actually think of the sword of the Spirit, which is what? It's the Word. It's the Bible. And how many times we get to swing in that sword of the Spirit around, making a mess that Jesus has to clean up. And usually it's because of our own pride. May we be those who love. But thank you, Jesus, for picking up our mess. And so, we move on to verse 12, and we're finishing up. We're going we're gonna to wrap up these last couple of sections here before we close this morning. Verse 12, Then the detachment of troops and the captain of the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus, and they bound him. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. And it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews, just a few chapters back, that it was expedient that one man would die for the people. So John throws this in here. Remember, it's the same guy who is the high priest, and because he's the high priest, he unintentionally prophesied that it was God's plan that one man would die for everyone. And so he just lets us know, this is the same guy now, this, this is the beginning of the kangaroo court, and we're not going to dive into it, but we are going to, to look at some of it next week. I'm just going to mention a few brief things. This, this court was unlawful. 
for, a, for quite a few reasons. But for now, just let us know that according to Jewish law, they could only hold court in the synagogue. And they just took this prisoner to the house of the high priest. They're holding a court, a hearing, in the high priest's home. That was illegal, according to their own law. Second thing is, they could only hold court with all of the Sanhedrin leadership present. And the Sanhedrin leadership was big. They did not have them all present in the middle of the night, this night. So there's the law number two that they broke. And third, it couldn't happen in the middle of the night. It was to happen during the day when anyone could come hear the hearing in public. So this is what we see here this, from this little section is that these guys, they really have no regard to honoring the law. They have an agenda to take Jesus out. And so they bind him and they lead him away to Annas' house. Now Annas was, used to be the high priest, and he's actually in control of all of the things that are going on. Uh, Caiaphas was his son-in-law. And history tells us that after Annas, he had two sons that were high priests, and then now, at this point in history, Caiaphas, his son-in-law, his daughter's husband, is the high priest. And he's really the guy behind pulling all the strings. In fact, when Jesus was in the temple court and he overturned the tables of the money changers and said, my house shall not be a den of thieves, right? When he did that whole scene, the pocketbook that he was hurting was Annas's pocketbook. He was in control of all of these things. So that's why they took him to Annas first and then Caiaphas later. So with that information, let's move on to the last little section we're going to look at as we wrap it up this morning. And that's verse 15. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That's kind of John's way of saying, I was there. And now at this, now that disciple was known to the high priest. So John's saying the high priest knew him and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of these man's, this man's disciples, are you? And he said to her, I am not. Now the servants and officers who had made a fire of coals stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. A couple of things here. The first is just some information that John wants to give, and it seems that John was the other disciple following with Peter, following Jesus, that the rest of the guys at that point, when Jesus was arrested, they did scatter. They scattered like sheep without a shepherd, like Jesus told them that they would. So Peter and John are these two that follow Jesus into enemy territory, and at first, Peter couldn't get in. For some reason, the servants of the high priest knew John, and they let him right in, and then they stopped Peter. We don't really get information as to why. Again, scholars like to speculate about what it was. Was he related to someone in some way? Or the kind of the one that I like is his dad owned a fishing business and had a fleet of, of fish, not fish, fishing boats. There we go. And they would take the, the catch from the Galilee area, and they would salt them to preserve them, and they would take them and, and sell them all over. And so there is tradition that maybe John was the runner, brought some fish to those guys, and they knew that, they, that John was one of the sons of Zebedee, and so they had this relationship with them. Again, we're not 100% sure. But Peter and John, they follow. For some reason, they know John. And so John gets to come back to the gate and say, oh, no, no, this guy's okay. You can let him in with me, which is an interesting thing. So she lets him in, but obviously they didn't know Peter. And so when the servant girl let him in, she said this to him. <laughs> she says, you're not also one of this man's disciples, are you? Which is interesting. There's a word in there that kind of jumps out, also, which means that She's not like hostile towards Peter. She understands that John is a disciple. She's like, are, are you also this man's disciple? And he replies saying, I am not. And if that's not bad enough, we leave Peter in a worse place as he goes over to the fire 
of not his enemies, but the enemies of Jesus. And he warms himself at their fire with them. So as we wrap it up this morning, I, I want to take just a moment to look at how Peter denies Jesus. And, and he doesn't deny any doctrine of Jesus. He doesn't deny any theology of who Jesus is or what he came to do. He doesn't deny any of those things. He just, under a little bit of pressure from a girl, at this point, he denies association with Jesus. And I think, when I, when I look at this, I think, you know, the enemy loves to do this to us. To get us in a place where we're uncomfortable and would deny association with our Savior. Which is a bummer. <laughs> I mean, after Peter comes to the realization of this, his heart is ripped out. Because what he realizes is, he was ashamed to be associated with pure love with love that he'd never known before. But this seems to be just a lapse of faith, a bump in the road with Peter. Also, I mean, we're going to look at this more in more depth next time, but he's in a completely different mindset because before, Jesus had just knocked the whole troop over. Peter boldly came out to defend Jesus. Now Jesus is bound, and he's being taken through the trial, and Peter's in a different place. And Peter is having a, a moment where he is shaken. And Jesus, again, he had just cleaned up Peter's mess with Malchus. And then he, he fails. When I think about this, I go back to the mess that Jesus cleans up. And I think to myself, I have failed in this same way for association with Jesus. In one way or another, maybe it was just a time when I didn't say something and I knew I should have. But I, I have failed. And I, I think about Jesus and who he is. It is an honor to be associated with the one who gave his life so that we might have life. No matter what the response to our association with him is, it's an honor. He has been so, so good to us. So what I want to do, it's the first Sunday of the month, and we partake in communion. I want to ask the guys to come up, and we're just going to take a moment as they hand out the, the communion elements. We're going to take a moment this morning to examine our hearts and our lives and to just, between you and him, to just say, Jesus, I'm sorry for the times that I failed. And Jesus, I thank you for cleaning up my mess. Jesus, I thank you for the blood that makes me white as snow. I thank you for all of the blessings that you've given. God, you're so worthy. And yeah, you guys go ahead and pass that out. Thank you. You're so worthy. And so what we're going to do, again, a little bit different than our normal communion. After you have your communion and you get it, go ahead and stand with me. And as we sing this song, you, between you and Jesus, you take this communion. You tell him, thank you for his body given. You tell him, thank you for the blood. You tell him, I'm sorry for the times I've let you down. But you thank him for that blood and that body because those are the, the emblems of that forgiveness that he has given to us. That he would look at us this morning past our faults and say, you're forgiven and you're loved. So this morning, we want to tell Jesus, thank you.
Father, we thank you for your forgiveness. Oh, we thank you for your mercy. I thank you that they're new every morning. God, we thank you for your love and your grace that draws us near to you and pulls us close. And God, I pray that it would do just that. We know that it's the kindness of the Lord that brings us to repentance. And so we thank you for the blood, the body that you have given so that we could be made right and have that right standing. Lord, we praise you this morning. We thank you for cleaning up our messes, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name and all God's children said, amen. Amen. God, richly bless you guys as you go out today. Be filled with the Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen.